This video is brought to you by Dashlane. Never forget a password again. Greetings, Mother Factors, my name is Sam, and today I'm going to be digging deep into some classified files and probing through some real sneaky business as part of this video on the FBI. Yesterday, we're going to be looking at all the clandestine activities and maybe some shady goings on of one of the planet's most iconic intelligence organizations. And hopefully, by the end of it, I won't find myself on some sort of troubling list that the FBI keeps on British Marvel nerds. But why, oh, why are FBI agents called G Men? Rise and shine. Why did the FBI send a very angry letter to Martin Luther King? And why is there a tiny camera poking through the ceiling of this recording booth? That wasn't there when I recorded 100 More Facts About Fortnite. Yeah, let's dab on them. Mm. Oh well, I'll take my chances. Two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so grab a cup of strong coffee, gruffly loosen your knot in your tie, and prepare to be positively entranced by 101 Facts About the FBI. Number one. The FBI, or the Federal Bureau of Investigation, is the federal intelligence and law enforcement organization in the US, working domestically to tackle terrorism and foreign intelligence threats. Sounds pretty good, right? Yeah, let's see how it goes. Number two. The FBI currently works out of 56 field offices and 380 smaller resident agencies in the US overall, well, that we know of. For all we know, there could be an FBI outpost in any sleepy neighborhood in America, even yours. You could be an FBI agent and you don't even know it. Okay, that's probably going too far. Number three. The FBI employs around 35,000 people, and this can range between IT specialists, language specialists, intel analysts, and scientists. Yep, they need scientists. The scientists conduct forensic science, who'd have thought it, and analyze bodily fluids and tissue for DNA. Yummy. Number four. On the FBI seal, which has been in use since 1941, is their agency motto of fidelity, bravery, and integrity, which hilariously, if you think about it, spells FBI. <laughs> Finally, brilliant idealists from bureaus instinctively find brilliant idioms for branding, and genius for bloody idiots. Ha! <laughs> Wordplay is fun. Number five. Of course, many people have a perception of the FBI as undercover gunslingers forever finding themselves in badass shootouts and thrilling car chases. The reality, though, is often far more pedestrian. For one thing, more and more of the FBI's operations are focused online, and are dealt with with the FBI's Operational Technology Division, or OTD, which, according to their website, monitors encounters current and emerging threats through applied technology. Snazzy. But of course, you shouldn't rely entirely on the FBI to protect your online life, when you could use the stellar services of Dashlane, a fantastic service for protecting your passwords and personal information. They also happen to be the sponsors of this here video. What a coincidence. Dashlane allows you to encrypt all your data, financial or otherwise, with the use of a master password that is never sent or stored on Dashlane's servers. Meaning that, even if Dashlane gets hacked, your information will still be completely safe. Dashlane's tools let you have complex and unique passwords for every account, and will automatically put them into login boxes when you access any website, saving you precious clicking and typing time. It also comes equipped with a VPN, allowing you to keep your internet activity totally private and out of the hands of your ISP or hackers. They even scan the dark web for your details and let you know if they're being used by nefarious bad guys. And best of all, Dashlane's basic plan is completely 100% free. You can download it right now using the link in the description below or at dashlane.com 101 facts. We're even giving you discount on the premium version too, so why waste any more time? Go to dashlane.com forward slash 101 facts or the link below right now. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, maybe not a minute, that's too long. You can listen to me while you're doing it. Number six. That being said though, the FBI does indeed operate many offices abroad, covering 180 countries across the globe. These tackle international security challenges that relate to the safety of Americans domestically, so <laughs> take that CIA. Number seven. The current director of the FBI is Christopher Wray, who was appointed following the high-profile firing of former director James Comey by Donald Trump. Yep, fact seven, and we've already mentioned him. Prior to this, he was Bush's assistant attorney general from 2003 to 2005, and he helped oversee major fraud investigations such as the Enron case, which we'll get onto later. Number eight. If you want to be a super cool FBI agent, <laughs> You need to be between the ages of 23 and 37, have a four-year degree in a relevant field such as language or law, have three years work experience, a valid driver's license, and of course, American citizenship. With all that, you too could be one of those guys who takes over from those first on the crime scene and says, we'll take it from here. Number nine. Okay, remember what I just said? That's a little bit of a maybe, because apparently the FBI don't just take over a case like they do in films. It's more likely that they'll put together a task force and cooperate with local and state police when they come across something as serious to warrant FBI involvement. Kind of ruins my joke, really, but reality often does. Number 10. The FBI and CIA are often conflated and confused with one another, 
While both groups are in fact part of the US intelligence community, each of them have distinct roles and aims. The principal difference is that the FBI works domestically, <coughs> while the CIA works abroad, gathering information on foreign states and their citizens, and is specifically prohibited from snooping on US persons, meaning US citizens, resident aliens, and legal immigrants. Number 11! <laughs> Attorney General Charles Bonaparte and Theodore Roosevelt wanted to form a centralized law enforcement agency back in 1908 to combat the rise of anarchy in the US on a federal level. So they did! It was originally called the Bureau of Investigation long before it would grow into the intelligence behemoth that is today. Yeah, boy! Get it? Boy, B O Y, because the initials are oh, never mind. Number 12. Bureau of Investigation founder Charles Bonaparte was indeed related to the Napoleon. Bonaparte. He was his grandnephew, because <laughs> of course he was, and would appoint 23 investigators from the Department of Justice, and with eight more from the Treasury Department. Small beginnings can still bring big results. Much like Napoleon, I suppose. Number 13. Roosevelt initially wanted to recruit agents by bringing in border guards who passed marksmanship tests. Bonaparte, though, didn't think this de facto entrance exam was sufficiently rigorous, and so famously quipped that Roosevelt should have had the men shoot at each other and given the chance to the survivors. Oh, Bonaparte, you rascal. And that's how he invented Battle Royale games. Number 14. The BOI was originally formed with 34 people to start with, but by 1914, this number had ballooned to over 300, with another 300 hired in administrative office duties. Hot. Number 13. In these early years, agents would be placed in field offices in cities around the US, while other ex-border agents would be placed at the Mexican border to prevent smuggling attempts. They would be dealing mostly with extortion and trafficking at this point in time, but all that would change with the times. Number 16. The first director, or chief, of Boy was a fella named Stanley Finch, who had his own agenda as a somewhat obsessive opponent of prostitution, which he frequently referred to as evil. Under his leadership, the BOY fervently targeted prostitution rings before he left the position in 1912. Number 17. When World War I began in 1914, we've done a whole video on that by the way if you're not familiar on that, President Woodrow Wilson authorised the BOY to detain enemy aliens in America, i.e. Germans, with the Espionage Act of 1917. The BOI's role extended further and became a little more efficient at counter-espionage, but struggled as they lacked the numbers to enforce these laws. This would be one of the first examples of the FBI being used to tackle threats from foreign powers. Number 18. One of the most notorious methods for gathering intel was wiretapping, which started in the 1920s as a way to listen in on bootleggers smuggling alcohol during the Prohibition era. This would grow on to be a defining and controversial tool in the FBI's repertoire over the following decades. Number 19. In 1932, the FBI's laboratory was housed entirely within a single room and was run by a single technician named Charles Appel, who conducted his work using borrowed equipment. Not only that, the room in which Appel worked doubled as a smoking lounge. Wow, that's rough. Number 20. You cannot talk about the FBI without mentioning the Bureau's most notable figure, the first director, J. Edgar Hoover. Hired by the Justice Department as a clerk in the War Emergency Division at the ripe old age of 22, he would rise through the ranks and become head honcho of the BOI in 1924, only seven years later. Number 21. You may be wondering what Hoover managed to achieve in those seven years to gain such a prestigious role in the US Justice Department. Well, during the first Red Scare, that's when everyone was scared of communists by the way, Attorney General Mitchell Palmer appointed Hoover as head of the newly established General Intelligence Division, which was created to investigate radical groups and identify their members in order to root out communists and socialists who were deemed a threat to America. Damn commies! Number 22. Based on Hoover's intelligence, the BOI planned a series of raids which became known as the Palmer Raids, and the way these raids were conducted turned out to be very illegal and unnecessarily brutal. Innocent people were targeted and civilians were caught in the crossfire. Of the 10,000 arrested, around 95% of the cases against them were thrown out. Number 23. Hoover was known to use the FBI to target various groups of people he didn't like, building case files against LGBT people, African Americans, leftists, Vietnam protesters and even politicians. Hoover apparently often used the intel he found to harass, bully, and even get people fired from their jobs. Number 24. The targeting of the gay community was also rather rich, considering the significant rumours that Hoover himself was in a clandestine relationship with his very male assistant Clyde Tolson. s s, -s scandalous Number 25. To complete the set here, Hoover was also pretty sexist, so that's fun. Before Hoover, three women had been hired as FBI agents, but under Hoover, no women were ever hired in the role. Any female employees who were there had to wear skirts and dresses, and weren't allowed to smoke at their desk like their male counterparts were. Which is obviously very misogynistic, but also just bizarre. It's weird, right? That is weird. Number 26. 
Do you recognise the names Bonnie and Clyde, John Dillinger, Gregory Happenstance and Babyface Nelson? Well, one of them I made up, but the other three were some of the FBI's most notorious criminal marks. The years where this lot would be mostly at large would be known to the FBI as the Lawless Years, and would also define a decade of gangsters, bank robberies and also the Ku Klux Klan from 1921 to 1933. By the way, Gregory Happenstance isn't real. Number 27. One of the FBI's most notorious cases is that of bootlegger machine gun Kelly. No, not that one. After committing small crimes here and there and going in and out of prison, Kelly attempted a big score in 1933, kidnapping the wealthy Charles F. Urschel for a week before successfully ransoming him for $200,000. Urschel, however, was as sneaky as he was wealthy, and deliberately left as many fingerprints on every surface he could find for the FBI to discover. Number 28. He also managed to recall enough details of his kidnapping, such as noting the sound of an airplane flying overhead at the same time every day, and by counting footsteps while blindfolded, that the FBI managed to track Kelly down afterwards and make the arrest. Number 29. When Kelly was being apprehended, he famously shouted, Don't shoot, G-Man! I don't know why he did it in that voice, but hey. This coined the iconic term by which the FBI were known for many years afterwards is what an incorrect person would say. Oh, holler at your boy. Though it's been claimed that Kelly shouted the now well-known line, the phrase predates his arrest and was seen in the Lincoln Journal in 1932. Number 30. In case you didn't know, the G and G men is short for government, i.e. government men. While the term was officially slang for all government agents, G men eventually became specific to FBI special agents. Number 31. There is a popular myth that before 1934, BOI agents couldn't arrest people or carry firearms, and were only limited to making a citizen's arrest up until that point, like a glorified police community support officer. This, though, is not true. The legislation put in place after atrocities such as the 1933 Kansas City Massacre happened, where agents and officers were killed in the line of duty, merely extended and solidified the FBI's use of firearms. Number 32. One of the FBI's biggest adversaries was John Jack Rabbit Dylan Jack. Now he was a thief, a bank robber, and a gangster whose exploits caused havoc between 1933 and 1934. He was a former Navy officer before he failed to hold up a local greengrocer, condemning him to a life behind bars in Indiana State Prison. It was in there, though, that he learned how to rob banks properly, turning him into one of the most famous criminals of the century. Number 33. Fun little fact here, by the way, three of Dillinger's friends escaped from the prison the same day Machine Gun Kelly was caught, which pretty much ruined the great day federal law enforcement was having. Number 34. Over the course of Dillinger's criminal career, he robbed over a dozen banks, staked an undeniably impressive three jailbreaks, and killed ten people. Despite his immorality, many revered the outlaw for his life of danger and adventurous criminality. So, which is it in your hands, guys? Dangerous criminal or lovable scamp? You decide. Let us know in our fancy YouTube poll. Number 35. Dillinger's downfall would come outside the Biograph Theatre in Chicago, where he resisted arrest and was shot dead. Turns out his girlfriend of all people tipped off the feds that they were seeing a movie that day, which would be the one situation he would not be able to escape from. Number 36. Hilariously, ha 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 ha, the FBI's hunt for Dillinger actually cost around $2 million, roughly four times more money than Dillinger ever stole. That doesn't sound a lot, but in 1934, $2 million was roughly the equivalent of $37.5 million today, which is enough to buy at least 12 chicken nuggets. Number 37. In 1933, the Bureau of Investigation was linked to the anti-booze buzzkills at the Bureau of Prohibition, and rechristened the Division of Investigation. Only two years later, the organization was then again renamed, this time to its current title as the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Snazmatraz. Number 38. In 1935, the name Bureau of Investigation was finally changed to the name we all know and fear. Not me, I don't fear them, I've done nothing wrong. The Federal Bureau of Investigation. I mean, if you want to be incredibly nitpicky here, the name officially came into use in the 1936 fiscal year. Okay? Okay. Number 39. Hoover, yep, him again, used the media and the movies to portray FBI agents and detective police out to be heroes to improve the PR for the Bureau. His propaganda capitalized on the rise of the G-Man term, collaborating with Hollywood to create films like G-Men, The FBI Story, and Confessions of a Nazi Spy. Number 40. How, uh, friendly his superstar connections were might be up for debate, as Hoover kept files on a ton of Hollywood types throughout his career. These include major stars of the classic era of Hollywood, such as Marilyn Monroe, Charlie Chaplin, Rock Hudson, and Lucille Ball. Just FYI, BT dubs Hoover did not keep a file on the world's most beautiful woman and the light of my life, Jennifer Lawrence, because I have it on good authority, she wasn't born until 1990. Number 41. 
Legendary filmmaker Stanley Kubrick was looked into by the FBI because Arlie Burke, an admiral in the United States Navy and good friend of the Bureau, complained that the films Doctor Strangelove and Seven Days in May presented military leaders in a negative light and was therefore detrimental to the nation. Ooh, hit a nerve. The meaning of life. While it's sometimes reported that the FBI investigated singer and actor, but mostly singer Elvis Presley, based on the letters of concerned citizens outraged by his sweet moves and swinging hips, oh, this isn't exactly true. Elvis, though, does turn up in a few FBI files, as he was repeatedly the target of various extortion attempts. Number 43. Another one of the most ridiculous people to be followed by the FBI was Albert Einstein. The reason? Well, they thought he was a communist, of course. They always thought people were communists. Einstein's reputation as a subversive was bolstered by his activism against racism in the 30s, as well as the militant Nazi nationalism of the 40s and the American anti-communist hysteria of the 50s. Hoover himself called Einstein an extreme radical, and consequently kept a file on him which was 1,427 pages long. Number 44. Hoover was so fanatical in his anti-communist zeal that under his leadership the FBI even looked into the people behind the classic Christmas movie It's a Wonderful Life, which was accused of promoting communism through its negative portrayal of bankers and rich people. God, honestly, the FBI, get your rack together. Number 45. Between 1939 and 1940, Roosevelt gave the FBI, along with the Military Intelligence Service of the War Department, or MID, and the Office of Naval Intelligence, or ONI, primary responsibility in tackling espionage and sabotage and all the arges. Good times. Number 46. The FBI also formed the Special Intelligence Service, or SIS, to spy on Central and South American countries. This was in an effort to prevent acts of espionage and anti-US propaganda. If you're wondering why you've never heard of it, the SIS was closed in 1946, so that's why. Number 47. According to the FBI's own information, the organization investigated 19,299 alleged cases of sabotage during the Second World War. Though the FBI apparently found 2,283 cases of sabotage in the United States during the war, all of these cases were due to carelessness and lack of spite. None of them were attacks from enemy forces. Number 48. During the Second World War, the FBI arrested no less than eight Nazi spies after they were discovered to have been plotting sabotage within American territory. Two were imprisoned and the other six were executed. Number 49. In 1950, the FBI put into place the 10 Most Wanted Fugitives program to shed light on criminals at large to the entire nation, so that the public can help apprehend them. Yes, it does sound like an all-time 10 video, doesn't it? Number 50. If you are put on the Most Wanted list, by the way, bad luck, because the only way your name can be removed is if you're killed, apprehended, your charges are dropped, or if you are considered no longer a menace to society. Number 51. It's time for the Most Wanted Lightning Round! Woo! Out of the 518 people stuck on the list, 484 have been found, captured, or bumped off. It's not a great list to be on, basically, and wow, I started this fact off way too happy and way too, like, fluffy. Number 52. Interestingly, only 10 women have ever been featured on the most wanted list. Yay, women, I think. Is that the message we should go with here? I'm not sure. Number 53. Remarkably, however, Hoover maintained throughout the 1950s that the Mafia did not exist, and openly referred to any evidence of its presence in the United States as baloney, despite considerable evidence to the contrary collected by his own agents. He even obstructed the Kaforfa Committee, which concluded that there was indeed a nationwide crime syndicate known as the Mafia, because obviously there was. Don't you watch movies, Hoover? Oh wait, yes you do, you just think they're all communist propaganda though. Number 54. In the 1960s, the FBI paid a former Mafia enforcer to solve the murder of three civil rights workers by the KKK. This guy put a gun in the mouth of a Klansman to convince him to give away the burial location of the victims. Because apparently now, this is an 80s action movie where the good guy has questionable methods, but goddamn does he get results. That's mental, I can't believe that's real. Number 55. On the 22nd of November 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald assassinated JFK. You've probably heard all about that, but in order to catch Lee Harvey Oswald, the FBI conducted a staggering 25,000 interviews and followed over 10,000 investigative leads. That sounds like- I mean, my hand is hurting from that, just from all the writing to do with it. Number 56. Hoover's efforts involved working against the civil rights movement by arresting black activists claiming that they were part of a communist conspiracy against the United States. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech convinced J. Edgar Hoover that King was a most dangerous and effective leader. His words there, by the way. As a result, King was followed, had his phones wiretapped, and was denounced as a communist. Number 57. In 1964, Martin Luther King received a threatening letter which made a number of aggressive accusations and insults against him. The anonymous sender referred to King as an evil, abnormal beast, and claimed to have audio recordings of King in hotel rooms with different women, making reference to his supposed adulterous acts. 
Number 58. The letter ended with the charming implication that King should commit suicide within 34 days. The reason we mention this is because King suspected the letter was sent by the FBI, and he was of course correct. Luckily, the FBI's attempt to blackmail and bully King did not deter him or stop the civil rights movement, which culminated in 1968. Number 59. But MLK was not the only black activist that the FBI screwed with due to racism. They also targeted groups like the Black Panther Party, a black power and community support organization initially created to monitor and challenge police brutality. Throughout the 1960s, the FBI systematically and would often illegally harass the Black Panthers as part of their counterintelligence program, commonly known as COINTELPRO, which ultimately resulted in the defamation, imprisonment, and murder of numerous prominent Black Panther members. Number 60. In 1964, the FBI conducted its My Burn investigation, also known as the Mississippi Burning, which looked into the murders of three 20-something civil rights workers, one black male and two white males. This led to the sentencing of eight KKK members, including the Imperial Wizard of the White Knights of the KKK of Mississippi. Number 61. Until his death in 1966, Walt Disney himself became an informant for the FBI, handing over names of people he believed to be dirty commies. In exchange for this, the FBI let Disney film the Mickey Mouse Club in their headquarters. What? Because apparently G-Man stood for Goofy Man all along. Number 62. Hoover was employed by the federal government from 1924 to 1972, spanning a staggering 48 years in power that was ended only by his death from a heart attack in his Washington home. It was only after his passing that the extent of his misdeeds became public knowledge, and up until that point he was considered by many to be an American hero. Number 63. To prevent a situation like Hoover happening again, the public law 90351, not as snappy as 90210, was passed, which would put a 10-year term limit on the role of FBI director. This would come into effect after Hoover left or died, which he did, the second one. Nintendo 64. If you think the FBI spend taxpayer money efficiently, then rest assured that that's not always the case. On one occasion, they spent four whole months listening to the song Louie Louie by the Kingsman after an outraged parent wrote to the Attorney General of the United States, alleging that the song was somehow obscene. Plot twist, it isn't. After investigating the song for weeks and weeks on end, the FBI eventually concluded that the lyrics were unintelligible at any speed. <laughs> Brilliant. Number 65. The FBI at some point also considered Borat to be a threat worth investigating. Actor Sasha Baron Cohen described having to purposely avoid and lose pursuing FBI agents so that they could continue filming. He claims to have been stopped by law enforcement around 45 times. Very nice. Number 66. The FBI also looked into ESP, also known as extrasensory perception, also known as telepathy, also known as mind reading as a method of espionage. The FBI did seriously try to develop some X-Men mind reading to beat out the commies in the spy game. Hey, you know what they say though, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. That shot in question was genuinely attempted to be Charles Xavier, but still. Number 67. The Bureau continued its streak of stupid cases by spending two years looking into an anti-goth cult which does not exist. Citing a Yahoo group, God Hates Goths, a scared goth reported his grievances with the God for Second Goth gripe group, getting the government goaded into investigating. Turns out God Hates Goths, Parents Against Goth Movement, God's Hammer Baptist Church, and all other affiliated goth hate groups were a parody, which was clearly stated on those sites with a disclaimer. Ah, oh, poor little goths. Number 68. In 1984, the FBI, alongside various other government organisations, conducted Operation Greylord, referring to the wigs UK judges famously wear in the courtroom. The investigation found many judges and government officials to be guilty of accepting bribes. Oh dear, guys. Come on, that's page one, isn't it? Number 69. Greylord, baby. <laughs> The first person to be found guilty of the illegal activities being investigated by the FBI as part of Operation Greylord was a corrupt deputy traffic court clerk in Cook County with the hilariously appropriate name of Harold Conn. Number 70. Operation Greylord eventually led to the indictment of 92 officials, including 17 judges, 10 deputy sheriffs, and 48 lawyers, most of whom pled guilty and were convicted. The whole ordeal was one of the biggest investigations out in corrupt government officials in the history of the United States. Number 71. Uh, the FBI arrested dozens of spies in the 80s, but 1985 was dubbed the Year of the Spy by the American press in reference to a series of high-profile arrests made by the FBI and some huge east-to-west defections. These include John Anthony Walker Jr., a United States Navy Chief Warrant Officer and Communication Specialist who was convicted of spying for the Soviet Union between 1968 and 1985. Number 72. The FBI also caught intelligence analysts Larry Wu Tai Chin, Jonathan J. Pollard, and Ronald William Pelton, who spied for China, Israel, and the Soviet Union, respectively. It was definitely a good year for the FBI. Number 73. In 1987, Ronald Reagan selected a former federal judge by the name of William Sessions to take over as the director of the FBI. However, 
Soon after his appointment to the role, it became clear that Sessions was using his position unethically. He was utilizing FBI resources to make improvements to his own home, and even used said resources for his own vacations and trips, an explicit violation of federal law which you'd assume as a former judge he would have the good sense not to breach. Not a doubt of all, but... Despite considerable evidence for his illegal activity, Sessions refused to resign, even throughout a six-month-long investigation into the FBI. Eventually, President Billy Clintz, or Bill Clinton, was forced to personally step in to sack, that's English for fire, Sessions from his position, which constituted the first sacking, that's British for firing, of an FBI director in the history of the organization. Number 75. Possibly the biggest white-collar fraud case the FBI ever took on was a five-year-long investigation into the Enron Corporation, a huge energy company that collapsed after execs lied about its value, duping investors into buying stock. The FBI's investigation looked through four terabytes of material, which in the early 2000s was a stupid amount of raw data. Number 76. The FBI's investigation ultimately led to the conviction of several top Enron officials, such as Jeffrey Skilling, Kenneth Lay, and Andrew Fasto. After the company went bankrupt, tens of thousands of Enron employees were left without jobs and pensions. Number 77. There is a town, a town called Hogan's Alley, which has its bank robbed twice a week. While that sounds like the local authorities not pulling out their thumb and catching some cheeky robbers, this is because the town is populated primarily by FBI agents in training. Simulated gunfights, investigating mock crimes, and surprise scenarios using cardboard cutouts and actors are there to challenge the would-be agents. Number 78. Interestingly, the FBI got the name Hogan's Alley from a late 19th century comic strip called The Yellow Kid. The comic strip in question was set in a rough neighborhood, making it an appropriate name for their crime-ridden fake town. <laughs> what absolute nerds. Number 79. The name Robert Mueller is likely familiar to you at this point in time, owing to his current position as special counsel overseeing the ongoing investigation into allegations of Russian interference in the 2016 US presidential election. What you may not know about Mueller, though, is that he holds degrees in politics, law, and international relations, served as a Marine in Vietnam, oversaw the prosecution of John Gotti and Panamanian leader Manuel Norega, and in 2001 became the sixth FBI director after serving as acting deputy US Attorney General. Imagine this guy investigating your corruption. <laughs> I'd wee myself. Number 80. Unfortunately for Mueller, though, he took the director of the FBI role on the 6th of September 2001. We all know what happened five days later. That is a rough first week. Number 81. Following the unprecedented September 11th terrorist attacks, the FBI began an investigation codenamed PENT-TWOM, short for Pentagon Twin Towers Bombing. The FBI dedicated 7,000 of its 11,000 special agents and thousands of FBI support personnel to the PENT-TWOM investigation. Number 82. Beginning only a week after the 9-11 attacks occurred, a series of letters containing anthrax spores were sent to various news media offices and to two Democratic senators. These attacks, referred to by the FBI as Amerithrax, ultimately left five people dead and made many more people seriously ill. Number 83. By early 2002, the FBI and the US Postal Service was offering $2.5 million as a reward to anyone with information leading to the arrest and conviction of the perpetrator. According to the FBI themselves, the most likely suspect of the attacks was an American microbiologist named Bruce Edwards Ivins. Not only has their investigation been strongly criticized, but Ivins committed suicide after learning that criminal charges were likely being filed against him. Number 84. In 2006, the FBI sent a convicted forger named Craig Monte to hang around mosques in Southern California while posing as a French Syrian Muslim named Farouk Al Aziz, in the hope of stumbling upon the copious amounts of Islamic extremism that was obviously festering beneath the surface of the American Muslim community. While spying on worshippers and very unsubtly talking about how much he totally loved terrorism, he wore robes with a camera hidden in one of the buttons and carried a set of keys containing a secret listening device. Number 85. The plan backfired, however, when the generally not extremist Muslims of Southern California started to feel understandably creeped out by the presence of a ludicrously pro-terrorism individual who one day just randomly started rocking up to their mosques, prompting them to take out a restraining order against him and report him to the FBI. Awkward. Number 86. Following the San Bernardino shootings of 2015 in which 14 people were killed, the FBI attempted to access an iPhone belonging to one of the perpetrators. However, they were unable to do so due to Apple's advanced security features. This prompted the FBI to request Apple to create a new version of the phone's operating system that could be installed on the phone to unlock it. Number 87. It was later revealed that the FBI had barely even tried to crack the phone before demanding Apple let them in, and many speculated that they were more interested in establishing a powerful legal precedent requiring future assistance. Hey, I'm just repeating what some people say. Number 88. Naturally, Apple weren't thrilled at the prospect of compromising the security of their software and resisted, fearing it would set a troubling precedent that could violate and exploit the right to privacy. After consulting a third party, however, the FBI managed to get into the phone anyway, and the case was dropped altogether. 
Why use Apple when you can pop round to your local shady phone shop? Everyone knows that, silly FBI. Number 89. The FBI's HQ is in the J. Edgar Hoover building in Washington, D.C. Yep, it's still named after him. They were due to move into a brand new building planned for either Maryland or Virginia, but this was abandoned after D. Trump took office. There are claims that the president's meddling in the project was due to a Trump hotel serving visitors across the road from the current HQ, and that if the FBI moved, Trump would have lost business. But hey, that's just a theory. A crazy, a crazy, crazy theory. Number 90. The FBI have many different teams and departments dedicated to different kinds of crime. But what you might not know is that they have one dedicated entirely to art crimes. This might seem a little excessive, until you learn that over a total of $165 million in stolen items have since been recovered since 2004. Neil Buchanan would be proud. Rest in peace, Neil. Oh, he's alive! Oh, I never would have guessed. Good, good for him. Number 91. The ruby slippers from The Wizard of Oz are essential footwear for any would-be Dorothy trying to get back to Kansas after a rough night, but in 2005, the ones worn by Judy Garland in the film were stolen from the Judy Garland Museum. The FBI located them and brought them home, but it took them 13 years to do so. Number 92. Who do you think has the second largest known stash of Bitcoins in the world? Some sweaty billionaire from Silicon Valley who had an incredible stroke of luck? No, of course not. It's the FBI, because this isn't 101 facts about sweaty billionaires from Silicon Valley. That's next week. They have seized around 174,000 bitty coinies from the deep web Silk Road, which according to exchange rates right now equate to around $666 million. So not that much really. Number 93. One of the FBI's databases holds around 411 million faces taken by facial recognition software, and it's entirely possible that they have your face on record too, as the FBI takes them from photos taken at airports, driver's licenses, and from passports. We're imagining it as a digital version of the Hall of Faces in Game of Thrones, just to make the image needlessly creepier. <laughs> Enjoy the nightmare, lads. Number 94. Some people collect pogs, others collect antiques. The FBI, however, collect guns. Lots of guns. In fact, much like some sort of drunk Texan Noah's Ark, the FBI looks to collect one of every type of gun ever manufactured in history. The collection of over 7,000 guns, which includes rare antiques such as the aforementioned stylish gangster John Dillinger's, Revol John Dillinger's Revolver, are used to help identify guns in crime and homicide cases. So it's not just for fun. Number 95. Though many music acts have fans one could reasonably describe as zealous or even militant, according to the FBI, the only fan base worthy of being described as a gang are fans of the Insane Clown Posse, also known as Juggalos. Yep, Juggalos were officially a gang. John Dillinger was a gangster, this is also now gangster. This is real. Oh good, you're not busy. Actually, Cassidy? I am busy. Number 96. Much like a normal human beings, the FBI love animals, so much so that they treat animal abuse with the same severity as a homicide case. That's nice, I guess. The argument is that animal cruelty is often a precursor to violent crimes and homicide. So while we end up saving cute furry lives, the FBI may also be preventing future human murder too. Number 97. The FBI has a fun and game section on their website. Is it a form of deep state recruitment for FBI child soldiers? I mean, probably not. Who's been listening to Alex Jones again? Number 98. Somewhat unsurprisingly, the FBI has its own special language made up of nicknames given to all kinds of things. For instance, an FBI car is known as a boo car, which is short for bureau car. Number 99. Another slightly odd example of the FBI slang is brick agent, a term which refers to an investigator who works on street level, as in someone who pounds the bricks by walking on the street. Real creative, guys. Number 100. Da, 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 da. Hilariously, numerous other agencies in the intelligence community often claim that the initials FBI have another meaning, owing to a perceived overestimation of the FBI's abilities. They contend that FBI does not stand for Federal Bureau of Investigation, but in fact stands for famous but incompetent. Ho <laughs> ho! Sick burn. Number one. 101. Turns out the FBI is actually excruciatingly slow to adapt to new technology, as the organization didn't make the switch from paper to digital until 2012. Hilarious. Apparently, they had been planning to upgrade several years earlier, but computer issues put them behind schedule and over budget. Oh dear me. Well, they're all digital now, and I bet they're watching 101 Facts About the FBI, which is just finished. Thanks to our sponsors Dashlane, remember to check them out in the link below, guys, or at dashlane.com slash 101 facts. It really is worth your time, and it's made my online life a hell of a lot easier. I feel like an FBI agent now. Hua. Remember to like and subscribe too, because that's nice. In the meantime though, check out these two videos on screen right now, one of them is really gonna wet your whistle and float your boat at the same time. Check them out now, Funk Soul Brother, and I'll see you next time. I'm sorry, I mean Funk Soul Brother or Sister, and I'll see you next time. Bye!